the first law of thermodynamics, the one which says that the total amount of energy is fixed, that energy can't be created or destroyed. Sometimes people, they say that that law states that there's no such thing as a free lunch, that energy is a little bit like money in a bank account, is that you can always account for it, that there is a ledger where you can add or subtract and you can keep track of the energy. There's, there's a beautiful example of this from Richard Feynman, where he tries to explain how energy works. And he says it's a little bit like a child who has a set of 28 wooden blocks that he uses as toys. And every day his mom comes in and she counts the blocks when she puts them back into their box. And every day she finds that there's 28. One day she finds only 26. She reasons they've got to be somewhere, and so what she starts doing is looking around. She looks behind the bed, and sure enough, a couple of blocks have ended up there. Another day, she's looking for these blocks. She only finds 15 or something. And she looks out the window, and sure enough, right, there are the remaining blocks. And in many ways, this is very much the same kind of thing. Provided you look hard enough, you'll always find that energy somewhere. So Feynman has this idea that the child says, no, 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 you're not allowed to look in that, in that box. And his mom says, what do you mean I'm not allowed to look? No, 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 you can't, the child screams. What she does is she weighs the box and she weighs the box over and over again. Every day she weighs it. And what she notices is a pattern. Sometimes it weighs a little bit more, sometimes it weighs a little bit less. But then she begins to understand what the pattern is for how many blocks are actually inside the box. So you don't necessarily actually have to see those blocks, right? You might be able to infer them in cunning ways. And in this sense, there's this idea that you don't really ever know how much there is in total, but you're constantly seeing differences, you're seeing changes. And so one of the things is that this fundamental rule is something that in science keeps us very, very safe. And whenever that rule is broken, you smell a rat. There's a snake oil salesman somewhere, right, who's trying to pull a fast one on you. In terms of the four laws of thermodynamics, I think to a particle physicist, actually, the conservation of energy is the most important one. If energy wasn't conserved, we'd have no predictive power whatsoever. To actually come up with equations of motion which describe a system, any system, like I'm talking throwing a ball through the air, a pendulum, a car rolling down the street, you have to assume that certain quantities are conserved. The wonderful thing is we can build up from such a basic concept like that, something as simple as saying, look, energy is conserved, energy in, energy out. In a particle physics collision, when we take two beams, collide them together, and everything flies out, mess happens, and we've created all these new particles. Some of those particles we can't detect in the particle detectors. So things like um, neutrinos, for example, they have almost zero mass. They really don't interact much. And so when we add up all the pieces of the collision and say, OK, did this collision start with Higgs boson and then decay to all these other products? If we add up all the products of the collision but one is missing, then we go, if we know that energy is conserved, then we can check what that missing product was. It's actually a method that's used in particle physics analysis is to use the sort of missing momentum method. And if you know the decay that you're looking for, then you can say, OK, I've measured these three things, I've measured those two things, I've got a missing momentum which corresponds to my neutrino. You, you can infer where it came from. If energy wasn't conserved, the answer would be different every time. We'd have no predictive power whatsoever of how things work in, in the world. Lightning is the flash of light produced by the natural discharge of a large amount of static electricity. This discharge is sometimes called a strike. Lightning is very common according to fulminologists, the scientists who study it. Lightning strikes somewhere in the world between 40 and 50 times a second. Yet, as common as lightning is, scientists aren't entirely sure what causes it. We do know that during some storms, clouds develop areas of positive charge and negative charge due to the movement of ice and water droplets within them. Negatively charged areas form at the bottom of clouds and positively charged ones form at the top. 
As the strength of the negative charge at the bottom of the cloud increases, it begins to repel negatively charged particles on the ground surface, causing the ground to accumulate a net positive charge. When the difference between the cloud and the ground overcomes the insulating effect of the air between them, the charge coalesces into a bolt of lightning that strikes the ground. This is called cloud-to-ground lightning. Cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning occurs when the strike is between two different clouds. If it's within oppositely charged areas of the same cloud, it's called intra-cloud lightning. At up to 54,000 degrees Fahrenheit, lightning is six times hotter than the sun. So seek shelter in a storm to avoid being struck by this powerful natural phenomenon. Turns out, they happen everywhere in the universe. A tornado is an example of a vortex, and vortices are universal features anywhere you look in outer space. The planet's largest outbreak sent 358 twisters across 21 states in April 2011. But on the sun, there are more than 30 times that many. 11,000 at any given moment. And these tornadoes don't have to be made out of air. They can be made out of hot gases and magnetic fields. The sun has so many tornadoes because it's churning with activity that sets pockets of hot gas by the thousands into swirling motions. Computer simulations show the tangle of magnetic field lines inside the gas and how the swirling action makes the gas shoot upwards, spiraling into funnels to form the solar tornadoes. The gas in solar tornadoes is so hot, its atoms are broken up into their positive and negative parts. Known as charged particles, they make up a state of matter called plasma. When we're in grade school, we learn that the world is made out of three things, solid, liquids, and gases. Wrong. The sun is made out of plasma. Most of the universe, including gas clouds and stellar objects, are made out of plasmas. We're the freaks. We're the oddballs. We're made out of solid, liquids, and gases. Most of the universe is made out of plasma. Get used to it. Getting used to it means realizing that most tornadoes in the universe have to be made of plasma's charged particles trapped into twisting clouds by magnetism in space. The tornadoes of Earth become the oddballs of the universe when we discover there are far more tornadoes in space than on our own planet. To get a tornado in space, you need something to be set in motion analogous to the wind, and you need some mechanism that makes them go around and spiral around, forming that funnel shape we're familiar with, with tornadoes. Then, get used to the fact that some of these things are zapping our planet every few hours, and literally, lighting up the sky.
Thank mm-hmm. you.